Okay, let's keep going. We got to question six. We're now gonna have a look at question seven. Okay, so in a triangle ABC, side um, side AB has length 10, AC has length five, and angle BAC equals theta, where theta is measured in degrees. The area of the triangle is 15. Now, I just need to see this as a diagram. That's just how my brain works. So a triangle ABC, AB has length 10, AC has length 5, don't worry it's not drawn accurately, and angle BAC is theta. Find the two possible values of cos theta. Well, they've told me this bit. This is the only thing I really know at this stage. I know that the area is equal to 15. I also know that area is a half AB sine C. So I can say that a half times a times b times the sine of the angle in between them, remember how that formula works, is equal to 15. So then I can just rearrange this. So I've got a half times 5 times 10. So I have 25 sine theta equals 15. And so sine theta is equal to 15 divided by 25, which is 3 fifths. But that's really annoying because they actually want the values of cos theta. We've got what sine theta is, but we need to now know what cos theta is. So if you're in my year 12 group, we haven't done this just yet, but I'm going to include this anyway. There is an identity, which is the uh, Pythagorean identity. Sine squared theta plus cos squared theta is equal to 1. I can substitute this in here, and I can find out what cos theta is. So if sine theta is 3 fifths, I can do 3 fifths squared plus cos squared theta is equal to 1. So that must mean that cos squared theta is 1 minus 3 fifths squared, which is 16 over 25. And this is where we're going to get two possible values for cos theta. Because when we square root both sides, I'm not even needing my calculator for this, I'm going to have the positive and negative 4 fifths for my values of cos theta. Okay, here we go. Given that BC is the longest side of the triangle, find the exact length of BC. Well, when you have this triangle and we know what um, cos theta is, and I'm trying to find out the third length, I'm hoping in your head you are going, I need to use the cosine rule. Now, the cosine rule is A squared equals B squared plus C squared minus 2BC cos A. So if I start using some values here, and we'll think about um, think about what BC is. So BC is this A squared that we've got here. So why don't I call it X? So I would have that X squared is equal to these ones squared. It doesn't matter which one is B or C because they get used next to each other here. So I'm just going to say 10 squared plus 5 squared minus 2 times 10 times 5 times the cosine of theta. Now, I'm going to just do a little bit of working out here, just to show you something. So this is going to be 100 plus 25, so that's 125, minus 100 cos theta. Now, we've got two different values of cos theta to choose from. We can either say that cos theta is 4 fifths, or we can say that cos theta is minus 4 fifths. Which one will make this x here, we want it to be the longest side of the triangle? Well, if you're subtracting something, you want this to be negative so it becomes as big as possible. So we're going to use that cos theta is minus 4 fifths, which gives me x squared is equal to 125 minus 100 multiplied by minus 4 fifths. You see those two negatives are going to come together and make the overall thing as big as possible. So I'm going to use the negative version of that, and I'm going to multiply it by minus 100, and I'm going to add on 125. So I get that x squared is, uh, whoops, is 205, which means that x is equal to the square root of 205. And obviously, uh, we're not going to take the negative one of that, because we just want it um, the positive. It's, it's a length. And it wanted the exact length of BC. So BC is root 205 centimetres. Making a mess here. And let's just check the moxium. So for question seven, we use that area equals a half AB sine theta. So you get two marks for getting that sine theta is three fifths. You get a method mark for using the Pythagorean identity. That's it rearranged here. And a final mark for just solving it and finding it. 
um, you then get a method mark for using the cosine rule and for using the negative version of the cosine that you came up with earlier, and then you get the accuracy mark for doing 205. Okay, let's keep going. Question eight. So question eight, this one is, it says a lorry is driven between London and Newcastle. In a simple model, the cost of the journey, C pounds, when the lorry is driven at a steady speed of V kilometers per hour is this thing that we've got here, okay? Find, according to the model, the value of V that minimizes the cost of the journey. Now, because this is not a quadratic, as soon as you see this, you should be thinking to yourself, okay, I get it. This is a differentiation question because I'm trying to find a maximum or a minimum. And you're also going to try and find the minimum cost of the journey as well. Now, sometimes people struggle when things are in terms of C and V. So if you really wanted to, you could replace the C with a Y and you could replace the V with an X. You could say, let Y equal C and X equal V, which would give you Y equals 1,500 over X plus 2x over 11 plus 60, and then you could do the question in y and x. People just find that a little bit easier. However, I will not do it this way because I want you to be as grown-up mathematicians as possible. So we are going to try and do part A here. We've got c equals, I don't like it when it's written like this, I like it in uh, the form I'm more familiar with. So we've got 1,500 v to the minus 1 plus, and I also like pulling this apart so that we have a, a coefficient, plus 2 elevenths v, plus 60. Now I want to differentiate this and the thing I'm differentiating this with respect to is v. So I'm differentiating it with respect to v, hence I get dc dv. So I'm going to pull the power down, so that's minus 1500 because I've pulled that minus 1 down and I'm going to reduce that power by 1. And very simply here I just get rid of that v and that disappears to nothing. So I want to find the minimum. Now that must mean that dc dv is equal to zero at a minimum or a maximum point. The gradient is zero, okay? So I'm gonna solve this equation. I'm gonna say that zero is equal to 1,500 v to the power of minus two is over v squared plus two over 11. So when I put this to the other side, um, I get 1,500 over v squared is equal to 2 over 11. So I'm going to multiply up the v squared. 1,500 equals 2 over 11 v squared. And I'm just going to keep going here. So I've got 1,500. I'll multiply it by 11, and then I'll divide it by 2. So I have 8,250 is equal to v squared. Square root both sides. And we get that v is equal to 5 root 330. But because this question is actually about something that's like real life, you do want to give that as a proper number. So I'm just going to press the SD button and I'm just going to say it as 90.8. Or maybe I'm just going to round that to, yeah, I'm going to leave it as 90.8 kilometers per hour. Let's just double check it was kilometers per hour. Yep, V is in kilometers per hour there. 98. 90.8 kilometers per hour, and I've just done that to one decimal place. I wrote this down because I thought it might be useful in a second. Now it wants us to find the minimum cost of the journey. Well, this thing tells me how to find the cost. To find the cost, you just substitute in the value of v that we've just found, because this is the thing that's going to minimize it, so we're just going to substitute it in. So for part two of the question, I'm going to say that v is equal to, and I'm going to use my most accurate version. I've already got it stored on my calculator. You can just see it on my answer bit there, so I'm just going to use the answer button. So I'm going to say c equals, and I'm just going to type it straight in. I'm just going to do 1,500 answer to the power of minus 1 plus 2 elevenths answer plus 60. And I come up with that the cost is 93.0289. But remember, it's in pounds, so I want to just put this as a proper cost, 93.03 pounds. Nice and easy for those marks we've got there. Prove by using the second derivative that the cost is minimized in the speed found in AI. So for part B, we know that if the second derivative is greater than zero, 
then it is a minimum. So what we need to do is find the second derivative. Let's write this out again, it might be helpful. So dc dv is equal to minus 1500 v to the minus 2 plus 2 elevenths. So I'm going to differentiate it again. I'm going to pull that power down. So you get minus 1500 multiplied by minus 2 becomes a positive v to the minus 3 plus 2 elevenths. That's just going to disappear. Now we know that v is equal to 5 root 330. I'm just going to put that back on my calculator. So I've got 5 root 330 so I can store it as my answer. And I'm just going to do 3000 answer to the power of minus 3. So I'm going to say when v is equal to this, the second derivative is equal to 4.00 times 10 to the minus 3, which is greater than 0. On to the next page. Hence, a minimum cost is minimized. Minimized. Okay. Part C of the question. Part C says, state one limitation of this model. Well, whenever it asks you about the model, I would always want you to go back and read what the model actually says. So, a lorry is driven between London and Newcastle. You should be looking out for anything that's unrealistic. Nothing is unrealistic yet. In a simple model, the cost of the journey when the lorry is driven at a steady speed of V kilometres per hour is... Okay, well, here is something that is definitely not very sensible or realistic. When a lorry is driven at a steady speed, I don't think it's going to be realistic for a lorry to drive at a steady speed for the whole journey. So one limitation is the lorry is going to be unable to steadily drive at the same speed. Okay, let's check the mark scheme. So we get mark for two marks for differentiating it and differentiating it correctly. You get a mark for setting it equal to zero and finding that v squared is 8,250. And you get an accuracy mark for coming up with v is 90.8. You then get two marks here for substituting in. And then you get answers that round to. AWRT is our answers which round to 93 pounds. So our one is 93 pounds and three pence is very good as well. This part, you get a second mark for differentiating it again. And when you substitute this in, you do get 0 0.004, which was 4 times 10 to the minus 3, which is greater than 0. So it's a minimum. And it would be impossible to drive at this speed over the whole journey. So that's to do with the steady speed. I'll just see some other things they suggested you could say here for part C. So you could say stuff, it would be impossible to drive at this speed over the whole journey. The traffic would mean you cannot drive at a constant speed. Anything that says that that constant speed is not going to be possible. Okay, question nine. G of x is equal to 4x cubed minus 12x squared minus 15x plus 50. Use the factor theorem to show that x plus 2 is a factor of g of x. So we need to actually explain what we're going to do for this first part. Let's just check it's just a. Okay, so if x plus 2 is a factor, then f of minus 2, remember it would be minus 2 for this, is equal to 0. However, I think I've written f, really, our question is about g of x, so I should have written this. So g of minus 2 is equal to, let's substitute in, so it's 4x cubed minus 12x squared, so that's 4x cubed minus 12x squared minus 15x plus 50 minus 15x plus 50. Now I know this is going to be zero when I put it in my calculator, but I'm going to do it anyway. So it's four times minus eight, minus 12 times four, plus 30 plus 50, and we get zero. Hence, x plus two is a factor. I'm just going to write down what this equation was so that I've got it so I can see it really easily rather than going up and down again. So we've got g of x is four x cubed, minus 12x squared, minus 15x, plus 50. Okay, part B of the question. Hence, show that g of x can be written in the form g of x equals x plus 2 
ax plus b squared, where a and b are integers to be found. So they want us to do some factorising of this, and we know that x plus 2 is a factor, so if I want to find out what this second chunk is, it may not come out like this straight away, I'm going to divide by x plus 2. So for part b of the question, I am going to find out what the remaining part is by doing 4x cubed minus 12x squared minus 15x plus 50. I'm going to divide it by x plus 2. So you say to yourself, what do I need to multiply x by to get 4x cubed? Well, I need to multiply it by 4x squared. So let's multiply them. You'd get 4x cubed plus 8x squared. Subtract these here and they cancel. Minus 12x squared minus 8x is minus 20x squared. And I'm going to pull down this minus 15x. So what do I need to multiply x by to get minus 20x squared? I need to multiply it by minus 20x. So that would give me minus 20x squared. And multiplying these bits together, I get minus 40x. Subtracting them, these cancel. And you've got minus 15 minus minus 40, which is 25x. And then I'm going to pull down that 50 that I've got there. What do I need to multiply the x by to get 25x? I need to multiply it by 25. When I multiply it by 25, I would get 25x plus 50, so that when I subtract these, I get no remainder, which means it fully divides. Hence, g of x can be written as x plus 2, 4x squared minus 20x plus 25. Now, we know they've already told us that they wanted it to be an ax plus b squared. Well, there's not too much work that you really need to do here because we know that the answer can be written like this. So the b bit, um, we'll have to be careful. It's either going to be a 5 or a minus 5 here. Ah, well, they've got minus 20 here. So for that bit to be negative, it's going to have to be a minus 5 here. And to get the 4x squared, we're going to have to have a 2x. And that should all be squared. I'm just going to check that. I'm actually just going to expand this just to double check. So we've got 2x minus 5, 2x minus 5. Let's see it works. 2x times 2x is 4x squared. 2x times minus 5 is minus 10x, minus 10x, and plus 25. Yep, yeah, it is correct. So we've de definitely done this right. So that means that a is 2 and b is minus 5. Okay. Then it says, figure 2 shows a sketch of part of the curve with equation y equals g of x. So this is the equation g of x, which we now know can be written as x plus 2, 2x minus 5 squared. Use your answer to part b and the sketch to deduce the values of x for which g of x is less than 0. Okay, well, g of x, let's first of all think about this that we've got here. Now, we can tell it's a cubic. We can tell that there's a repeated root here and that there's just a single root at this bit. Now, there's going to be a single root when x equals minus 2, and there's going to be a repeated root when you solve this at x is positive 5 over 2. So that's telling me that this is 5 over 2 because there's the repeated root, and this is minus 2. Now, we want, for this one that I'm going to do here in red, we want the graph to be less than or equal to 0. So, looks like this section here is less than or equal to 0, and it's allowed to be equal to 0 at this point. So, for ci, the values would be that x has got to be less than or equal to minus 2, or x is equal to 5 over 2. Those are the values when it would be less than or equal to 0. That's why you've got to include that one. And then for CII, it's got something extra going on. It says g of 2x is equal to 0. Well, if it's a g of 2x, think about what this transformation is. It is actually a stretch in the x direction of a scale factor of the opposite of what you might expect. It doesn't stretch outwards, it actually squashes it inwards. So the scale factor is a half. 
So that means it's going to look something like, oh my gosh, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do a very good job of this on here. It's going to be squeezed inwards. That should have been touching the axis. So if it's squeezed inwards, it will be at minus 1. And instead of at 5 over 2, if we half 5 over 2, we get 5 over 4. So the two places where we half these values, we're going to half this and half this, you get minus 1 and 5 over 4. So our values are x equals minus 1 and x equals 5 over 4. OK, let's have a look at the mark scheme. So we've got substituting in minus 2 and then saying when you get 0, you have to then say this shows that it is a factor. We were able to come up with this from polynomial division. So you get two marks for the method and one for actually coming up with this bit. And then you get the two final marks for factorizing this and getting it correct. And then the two values that give you um, less than that, were, sorry, give you less than zero or equal to zero was x equals 2.5. We said five over two and less than or equal to minus two. And then you've got minus one and minus 1.25, which is the same as five over four. So we got all of that right. Okay. We are going to keep going. We're going to do question 10 now. We're going to prove from first principles that the derivative of x cubed is 3x squared. Now, I like to do this kind of posh. So we're going to let f of x be equal to x cubed. And we know, and this is in the formula book, that f of x is equal to the limit as h goes to 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x divided by h. Now, people get bored of writing this. You have to write it until you actually take the limits. I want you to do this as, as good as possible. So we're doing f of x plus h. Well, our f of x is x cubed. So it is going to be x plus h cubed minus x cubed, all divided by h. So we're going to do a little bit of manipulation. Still keep writing the limit as h goes to 0. So when we do this here, you should know how to do this just in your head because it's a very, very simple one for the binomial. The binomial coefficients for the cubic, if you're not sure, is 1, 3, 3, 1. So it is going to be x cubed plus 3, reduce the power of x and introduce an h, plus 3, reduce the power of x and introduce another h, plus 1 multiplied by h cubed, minus x cubed, that's from this bit here, all divided by h. Okay, very clearly you can see that this x cubed and this subtract x cubed are going to cancel. So we get the limit as h approaches 0 of 3x squared h plus 3x h squared minus h cubed, whoops, plus h cubed, all divided by h. And now we can actually write each of those terms out and we can actually just divide them. So I'm going to do this divided by h. And now because it's no longer a fraction, it's separate terms, I'm going to do some brackets. So when I divide that by h, I get 3x squared. When I divide that by h, I get 3xh. And when I divide that by h, I get h squared. Now I'm going to take the limits. As h becomes tiny, 3xh also becomes tiny, and h squared also becomes tiny. And so these bits disappear. Hence, f dash x equals the only bit that we've got left which is 3x squared. The derivative of x cubed is 3x squared. Let's compare that to how they do it. I don't think they do it as formal as I would like you to, so I want you to try and do it as formally as possible. In question 10, there you go, you've got the idea of considering x plus h cubed minus x cubed over h. You've got a second method mark for doing the expansion. You then get an accuracy mark for having it divided by h as well and subbing in that you come up with this expression. And then that when h goes to 0, you get all of these bits disappearing and you just end up with 3x squared. So the derivative is equal to 3x squared. I'm just going to leave this bit up here. This is the thing I much prefer. I prefer the way it's kind of written at this stage that we've got. OK. Um, yeah, happy with that. OK, let's have a look now at question 11. Question 11 is binomial expansion. And we just want to find the first three terms in ascending powers of x, the binomial expansion of this to the power of 9. Now, you could do Pascal's triangle if you don't like using the calculator. 
but it's going to be kind of boring to get down to the ninth one. So let's just see how it goes, okay? We are going to do for 2 minus x over 16 to the power of 9. We know that our first one is going to be 2 to the power of 9. And our second one is going to be our 9 choose 1. You know how you've seen that before. In the mark scheme, they sometimes write it as 9 choose 1 like this. And you know how to get that on your calculator. Multiplied by 2 to the power of 8, multiplied by minus x over 16. Plus 9 choose 2, which sometimes gets written as 9 choose 2 to find the coefficient. I'm going to reduce the power of the 2 by 1. And I'm going to increase the power of the x minus x over 16 to squared. We only need three terms. We've got 1, 2, 3. Okay? The bits I've written here, uh, you don't necessarily have. I just I think either of these could be used. So 2 to the power of 9, let's just go calculating now. 2 to the power of 9 is 5, 1, 2. Then we're going to do 9 choose 1. 9 choose 1 is 9. So that's going to be 9 multiplied by 2 to the power of 8 divided by 16. And it's 144. But look, there's a negative here. So it's definitely going to be a negative 144x. Okay, so this one, let's just see what 9 choose 2 is. 9 choose 2 is 36. So we're going to do 36 multiplied by 2 to the power of 7. And we're going to divide it by 16 squared. And it's a negative being squared. So is it going to be a positive or a negative? Okay, it's the negative squared, so it's definitely going to be a positive. Okay, we said this was 36. So it's 36 times 2 to the power of 7. And I'm going to divide that by 16 squared. And I get plus 18x squared. Is that what I had before? I don't recognise that number. Yep. That's done for that first bit. Then we get some new stuff going on f of x is equal to a plus bx multiplied by 2 minus x over 16 to the power of 9, where a and b are constants. So that's weird. They're now multiplying it by something, a bit like um, kind of how you might expand quadratics. We're going to do this times this, blah, 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 but you, there's this 9 in the way. Given that the first two terms in ascending powers of x in the series expansion of f of x are 128 and 36x, find the value of a and the value of b. Well... If f of x is equal to a plus bx multiplied by 2 minus x over 16 to the power of 9, we can't do this, but we've just worked out this. So why don't we actually instead say we've got a plus bx multiplied by 512 minus 144x plus 18x squared. And we're going to just actually expand this and see what we come up with. So I'm going to multiply everything in here by a. So I get 512a minus 144ax plus 18ax squared. Now I'm going to multiply everything by bx in this bit. So that's plus 512bx minus 144bx squared plus 18bx cubed. And remember, we're really only interested in the first two terms, so the constant and the x bit. So, I'll start off with a constant. This is a constant because there's no x there, so I get 5, 1, 2, a. Now, the x bits that I've got, let's just grab these in a different colour. The x bits are this and this. I don't even bother about these because they've got nothing to do with it. So, I've got 5, 1, 2, a. I'm going to write this bit first. I'm going to factorise out the x in a second. So, I get 5, 1, 2, b minus 144a multiplied by x. And I'm just going to put plus dot 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 because I don't really, I'm not bothered about these things that I've got here. Now we've been told the first term is 128. So 128 is 512a. And I've been told that the second term is 36x. So 36x is 512b minus 144ax. That's the first term, that's the second term, that's the first term, that's the second term. So what I'm going to do is just solve this equation. Um, so I'll do 128 divided by 512, and you get a quarter. So that must mean that a is equal to a quarter. For this equation that I've got here, I can just get rid of the x for a second, so I get this. And I know that a is a quarter, 
So 36 equals 512B. 144 multiplied by a quarter is 36. Solving this equation, you get 36 plus 36, which is 72, divided by 512. And so you get that B is equal to 9 over 64. So A is a quarter and B is 9 over 64. Is that right? Yep, A is a uh, quarter, B is 9 over 64. We've answered the question. Let's have a look at the mark scheme. Okay, so we got the answers are 512 minus 144x plus 18x squared. 512 minus 144x plus 18x squared, very good. We got A is a quarter and B is 9 over 64. So we'll come up with those. Okay, I am going to stop at this point, do a separate video, and we're nearly there.